There we go. Episode four. With Hartley. Hello, hello. All right, all right. We can't play too much of it because we'll get copyright. <laughs> but yes, we have a very special guest in the building, Hartley. Thank you for joining us. On this fourth episode, yes. I'm gonna Ali and Rebecca, thank you so much for having me and inviting me to come on. Yes, no worries. Um, so before we even begin with anything, how are you doing today? How's everything? Doing well. We're approaching reading week, which feels like it came really quick. And I don't know, from my end, I don't know if I feel it just from my facilitator perspective, but it just feels like the term just got underway. Things are starting to move, classes are starting to gel, and now we're taking a pause. So it's a bit of a, a weird time, though I understand um, for students that might be really welcomed and necessary. Yep, definitely looking forward to the reading week. <laughs> yeah. So do you wanna introduce a little bit about yourself, what classes you facilitate, and a little bit about your personal life? Absolutely, so my name is Hartley Jaffeen. I'm a facilitator with the Bachelor of Health Sciences program and the Arts Lab program. The courses that I do within BHSC are many, but I started off in BHSC starting with two courses, uh, Health Sci 3CC3 Theater for Development and Health Sci 2J03, which was formerly Habits, which is now morphed into the new Praxis curriculum. The other courses that I facilitate within BHSC is Inquiry, a 3E03 section looking at health and science and literature, a second year course on art space research, artistic explorations of community issues. And recently, Jen Nash and I developed and I was able to facilitate last semester, Surviving Survivor 3 SS3. Wow, yeah. so many courses. Yeah, and Rebecca knows all about that last one. Yeah. <laughs> because yes. You actually <laughs> took that course, didn't you, Rebecca? Yes, indeed I did. Love the course. Highly recommend for anyone uh, going into third year or fourth year or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. A lot of uh, first year and second year um, students that follow us um, definitely check out a lot of the courses that Hartley does uh, teach. A lot of them are coming up in third year and afterwards. And also um, the inquiry courses for third year, um, they're also there. Um, so Hartley, the first thing that we wanted to start off with was what's your view on the whole virtual learning experience? So we've had students talk about this all the time. We talk to our friends about it, what we like about it, what we don't like about it. But we haven't heard from professors themselves how they're adjusting and what are some of the pros and what are some of the cons. So just your general overview of how it's been going so far and what your experience is. So ultimately, from my perspective, it's been going fairly well. If I'll be honest, I miss <laughs> being in a classroom space with students more than anything. I really wish we could be back together in an MBCL room, um, talking together in the same shared space. Though, because we can't, I think that most of the courses that I've been facilitating have translated fairly smoothly online. Uh, the discussion is still really rich. The activities have to be modified, but are still able to be experienced and explored. Online learning offers some really cool advantages that, that I know from talking to other faculty members. We're thinking about how do we capture that again when we go back to in-person teaching and learning. Things like, uh, I, I did a session, a Praxis session with, with Lainey and Stacy uh, for 1X01, the first year Praxis course. And we had done it last year in person and then we did it this year in the fall online. And one of the things that we noticed was that when we asked the students to engage in an activity, when we asked them to share what the experience was like, when we were in person, we had a handful of students, maybe five to 10, put up their hand and share what, the, what their experiences were like. And this time around, we did the same thing. We asked people to unmute their mics and share and pop their experiences in the chat. What we got were the same amount, five to 10 students who offered their thoughts and opinions um, unmuting their mics. And then we had, I don't know how many, 20, 30, 40 students that were offering their responses in the chat. And that is something that we miss in in-person teaching because those 40, 50 voices 
wouldn't necessarily be heard. And so we were able to look at the chat, read the chat, see how students were engaging with it, even if they didn't feel comfortable unmuting. And with that said, I suspect that there are a lot of students who are finding online learning much more comfortable to share their thoughts in an online space versus in person with all eyes watching you. And I also recognize that there are some students that are finding it really challenging to be online and, and offer their, their thoughts and opinions, knowing that you can, with the online learning, you can watch yourself giving the answer, which I think is really unsettling for some. So there are pros and cons to the online learning experience. Yeah, I definitely agree with the part where messaging in the chat is so much easier than actually raising your hand and unmuting and talking. I would have never asked so many questions if the class was in person and I'd just be sitting in the back confused as usual. So Yeah, and I think especially in smaller classes, maybe in some large classes, like if you're in a first year chemistry class, um, the chat function doesn't work as well as it does with like a small class or an inquiry class of like 20 people, I feel like it's much more useful there and you get a lot of engagement. So that's very interesting. I didn't even think about that. When you brought it up, I just thought about like, this is actually an extra avenue, as you said, of people engaging with class content. That's very yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. And it'll be exciting to see how and if what sticks when we're back to in-person. What are the things that carry over that are really, really valuable? And what are the things that are, are we're going to do away with and go back to the, the way it used to be. Yeah, another thing I really enjoy about the messaging feature in uh, Teams is that you can upvote or like heart the message. Yeah. So if someone has a question that I wanted to ask, I can just upvote it and the professor can see, oh, this question, uh, a lot of people like want me to answer this question. So the professor can really gauge at what the students are confused about and what they're not confused about. That's true. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. And even things like, I mean, breakout rooms work very similar to small group discussions. So in some ways it's been a straight uh, kind of one for one in those respects. But there are also other things that, that I find really that I miss. Something as simple as eye contact that I know that do I want to talk to, to the camera because I want students to, to watch me. And I'm also wanting to look at the student responses. And so that's kind of a weird um, perspective as a facilitator is that it's hard to want to speak directly to the audience, but also watch the audience. But online learning doesn't allow for you to do that simultaneously. Yeah. So would you say, would you say it's more helpful as a facilitator to, for, to have people have their cameras on when, when you, you are in one of those classes? Okay. Uh, absolutely. The, just for me, the, the energy that I get from the classroom space is really fueling and allows me to see, okay, they're really engaged or they, or the class seems bored. I need to do something differently. I need to ask a different question or do a different exercise. So it allows me to get a pulse of what's going on in this space. And having cameras on is just really valuable for having discussions or in my theater class, doing activities where it requires people to see each other and to devise together as much as possible. I recognize that some students aren't able to have their cameras on for a whole host of reasons. But for me, my philosophy is if you can have your cameras on, please have your cameras on. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And I love, oh. Yeah, okay. go ahead, go ahead, Rebecca. I've been talking too much. <laughs> I love it when students have their cameras on as well, but I'm the type of person where it's like, okay, like 80% of people have their cameras on. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera. <laughs> you know, if it's less yeah. than 79%, no, camera's not going on. There is a critical mass. And you, you've seen it, I've seen it, especially in, in bigger classes that I've taught in BHSC and at Mac and in other, other spaces that I've been involved in teaching is that you're with a group of, let's say, 50 people. And a few people turn on their cameras right, right away. And all of a sudden, they notice that other cameras off, and then they quickly snap off, uh, which is really kind of interesting. And I'm like, oh, if you held on a little bit longer, who knows? You might have gotten more people to turn on their cameras. Yeah, that's literally me. <laughs> yeah, but Harley, to be fair, though, I want to point out that all of the classes that the students do have their cameras on, like 95% of them are BHSC classes. They're either my inquiry classes or BHSC tutorials. Um, usually, all the other classes that I'm, that I'm in that are electives, everyone's off. Like, even if it's a small class, like a class of 20 people in a tutorial, it's always off, so. And that's been my experience too. I feel very fortunate because friends of mine that teach 
at a whole a variety of programs and institutions have said that a lot of the cameras that they're finding are off. For me, all of the courses that I've been teaching with BHSC have the cameras a bit on, the exception being 2XO, uh, 2XO3 because it's all second year. So it's a bigger class and I imagine that in a larger class, I understand why cameras might be off. But in all of the classes, inquiry and all of my upper level courses that have 20, 30 students, for the most part, majority cameras are on. Fair enough. That's actually a great segue to our second topic that we want to talk to you about. Rebecca, do you want to read some of those things that we discussed earlier? Oh, yes. So uh, have you ever heard of ratemyprofessor.com? I have. I have indeed heard of it. Oh, have you no. ever looked yourself up <laughs> on it? I have. I've, I've, you're tempted to, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you feel about your rating? You know, you have a very high rating on Rate My Professor, 4.6 out of 5 stars. That's wow. very impressive. I just want you to know that. Very 100% impressive. would take again. Wow. <laughs> it's extremely, I mean, it's extremely wonderful. I, I just, I, it's, how to, how to answer that, Rebecca. <laughs> It's one of those things that I'm, I'm so grateful that students feel that way, that students are, take a class that I offer within the BHC program or the Artside program and say, yeah, would take again. To me, that's, that's a win. <laughs> yeah. One of the reviews says, one of the most amazing professors I've had at McMaster. He's so much fun in class and such a nice guy. He makes the three hour, 8.30 a.m. classes bearable. That's difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 8.30 a.m. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> so how did you learn to become a, such a great facilitator? Well, part of it is I think my training helped me in a lot of ways. Because being trained in theater and improv and being able to be flexible and adaptable, that really much, really aligns well with the role of a facilitator. And in thinking about my, my graduate training, when I was training to be um, an applied theater practitioner, a lot of the applied theater practitioner skills that I learned are applicable when you're teaching and facilitating applied theater or when you're doing non-applied theater courses. So that has been really valuable. Part of it has also been mentors. You know, having mentorship within the BHC program, being able to watch and engage with my colleagues, with you know, Stacy and Dell, uh, the deans of the program, and and seeing how they operate in a classroom space and seeing how they have been able to um, to facilitate kind of my own learning and my own understanding of how to be a facilitator, that's been really valuable. Co-teaching with Parmjeet and Jen Nash and Margaret over the years has been extremely um, eye-opening in terms of how I approach my facilitation. And a lot of it has to do with trial and error. You know, being, being willing to, to try something out and seeing, will this work? And if it does, amazing. And if it's a complete flop, well, then won't do it again. Um, and I think for me at the core, good facilitation is about relationships and relationships, connection, and empathy. And so those are the pieces that I try to put first in any of the classes and anything that, I, that I'm involved with. And so I'm glad to hear that students are, are feeling that as well. And also, I want to let you know, Hartley, some of the inquiry courses, especially in first year that we take, literally those like ideas that the facilitators put on in our heads, like be curious, um, always ask questions and things like that, they kind of stuck with me all throughout. So I want to let you know, like it is very like it has you guys have a very big effect as facilitators on us. So I really appreciate you like actually taking the time to, you know, facilitate those situations. I, I think, I literally think it takes a certain level of patience and person to facilitate those groups because like, I, I can't see myself like doing it effectively. So I really appreciate it when I see you guys do it so well. Yeah, I definitely agree with that sentiment. Can you imagine a class of 20 freshmen <laughs> right out of high school. I don't know how you do Remember it. the first thing we walked into class, I remember the first thing we did was literally nothing. Everyone was sitting in silence. <laughs> Nobody knew what was going on. Well, maybe I shouldn't even put this away, but yeah, we were so confused. We had no idea what was going on. And then as time went by, like I thought it was a very interesting way to explore some of those things. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, and in a lot of ways, 
A facilitator also doesn't know what's going to happen. In some ways, a facilitator, especially the first class, will enter with, okay, um, I know it'd be valuable to have the class get to know each other because that just seems like a, a very important thing to do in the first class. But how that class gets there and how that class opens the conversation, I've facilitated inquiry since 2012 and every year the way that, that first year inquiry class opens is completely different just because it's a different mix of people in a different space. So uh, you've been in BHSC for a long time then. Wow. What has been your favorite memory in BHSC? Ooh. So one of my favorite memories, and it's, it's not necessarily isolated to one, but I think one of my favorite memories as a whole within BHSC has been one of the core staples of 3CC3 and 2JO3 habits, which um, has now been retired, is that I always started 3CC3 and every 2JO3 experiential tutorial with Penguin, an exercise that I do uh, where I waddle around the space and try to sit down in chairs. And having students engage in that exercise is such a joyful memory for me because it's so such a playful game and it really sets the tone for what the courses are about. And for me, that's something that I always love doing. It's the, the first moment where students are in the class and they don't know what to expect. And I'm able to jump into an exercise that really communicates a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of information about me, my style and the class. So those moments are things that really resonate with me. In addition to that, just being able to, in 3CC3, watching students do their performances, their scene studies, or in 3SS3, watching the experiential, um, the engaging explorations and seeing how students engaged with the survivor episodes, or in 2A3, we create a final showcase at the end of the semester. Those moments where we're seeing all of our hard work on the semester pay off, those moments are extremely memorable to me as well. Um, kind of watching, watching the aha moments where students are kind of figuring out, okay, what does this mean in terms of applied theater? Or what does this mean in terms of arts-based research? And then the, oh, yeah, I get it now. Those moments really, really stand out to me. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there one course in particular that you have a preference for when those moments happen a lot more than in others? Or you would say it's spread it's, out pretty It's spread out. It's, it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's different. I mean, yeah, they all, because they all approach the conversation differently. So the aha moments will look different depending on the, the course. Mm. So what's your favorite course to teach? Oh, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> you can't ask that from a teacher. That's like asking a student. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I had to. I've had this question. This question gets asked a lot. One of the things that I always say is that 3CC3 always has a soft spot in my, in my heart because it was the first course that I, I facilitated for BHSC. Mm -hmm. And so it was my first experience bringing theater to BHSC. And so for that reason, it's the course that I've done the longest. It always holds a special place for me. Though other, other courses that have been developed over the years are equally cool and insightful and special just in their own different ways. Uh, so I don't know if I can say my favorite ones to teach because they do take on very different feels when you're in them as a facilitator. You heard that, everybody. Everyone take three CC straight. <laughs> 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 okay, fair enough. That was a very good PC answer. I liked it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, cool. So we can move on. Um, I had another thing written down here that we wanted to ask you, um, and that was... If you could go back in time and you have all the knowledge that you have at the moment, what would be um, like the biggest advice you would give yourself? I'm only asking it this way because um, this advice that you are giving yourself is indirectly something that you would advise everyone else to do as well. So mm -hmm. in that sense, like what would be some, some of the biggest things that you would tell your younger self that was an undergrad that was studying an undergrad uh, program? And it's funny because I know this happens a lot where if I, were to tell, if I were to go back now and tell me, I wouldn't believe me. In the same way that I'm sure parents or guardians or loved ones tell you things and you go, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. That's true. Oh my God. So true. Though I think the one piece that I would probably tell myself is 
something that I tell the first year inquiry classes when students say, hey, I heard that in another inquiry class, they're doing this. Are we, are we doing inquiry wrong? Or mm -hmm. should, should we be doing this? Mm -hmm. And my response is always, the inquiry class is where it needs to be. We are exactly where we need to be. Mm -hmm. And that advice I would give to myself, because when I was an undergrad, there was a lot of forward thinking around, what, am I doing everything right to set myself up for whatever it was that I was gonna pursue, which at that point I, I wasn't 100% sure and confident in. And being able to go back and tell myself, you're exactly where you need to be and enjoy that experience of being there and take advantage of all of the opportunities that, that being in first year offers, that being in second year offers, that being in third year offers. And there were certain moments where I would, I would prioritize certain things that maybe looking back weren't as important as I thought they were. Um, where you know, possibly giving up social opportunities to ensure I did, you know, I got a X grade instead of a Y grade when really the difference was negligible. And had I gone for the social engagement, I probably would have gained more than had I stayed in my room and studied that, that little bit longer. Yeah, that's definitely really good advice because I hear people all around me, especially in our program, always saying, oh, she's doing that, she's doing this, so I don't feel good enough. And it's all like, <laughs> you just have to be satisfied with where you are right now. Yeah, and just going back to your specific example, like specifically in inquiry, I remember our class asking the same question, like, wait, our friends aren't doing that in their class. What? Something must be wrong. And then we tried to do the activity that they did, yep. and it wouldn't work out because that's just not our style. That's not how we wanted to do things. So that's very interesting. That I remember that. asking that same question to an <laughs> inquiry. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because because you see, it's, and I I mean I get it. It's natural. Right? You look around, yeah. you see what other people are doing, and there is this this fear that you're not your class isn't doing it right, or that you're not you're not doing whatever the thing is that's quote unquote right, even though there is no there is no right. Yeah, man, I miss inquiry so much now. First year inquiry was one of the <laughs> best experiences I had because I don't know, I just miss it so much. It was so fun. It was the first thing that you went into BHSC and you're exposed to that environment. I just really liked it. It was a great introduction. I really miss it, to be honest. Same. I think I made a lot of my close friends in that class. Shout out uh, Nikki and Dia as well. <laughs> So that was nice, especially yeah. with first year classes that are huge. It's super hard to make friends in those types of classes. I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that when you were in undergrad, you didn't know what you wanted to be in the future. Yeah. But has your interest always been in theater? And if so, have you ever considered going into the film industry or anything? <laughs> so my interest starting from grade 12 was always theater. Prior to then, I always say that grade 10 and probably grade 11 me was going to be an English major. That was, mm -hmm. the, that was the plan until I really started to get involved in theater and then took a bit of a turn. Um, so since, since grade 12, theater has been the track. But film never interested me. And the reason why is I love the liveness of what a live theater performance brings. You can't cut. If something goes wrong, it's up to that collective and that community to figure out how to fix it in real time. And for me, the thing that is really exciting about theater is that the stakes are high, that an audience is paid to see a performance and you're going out there to, to perform what you've rehearsed for months for this audience. Or if it's an improv show, you're gonna take what they give you and then turn it into a show that hopefully they find funny or amusing or entertaining. So film, film is, is I've, I've done a couple of things in film, but for me, I really, I love, probably the reason why I enjoy facilitating is that it's, it's a, to use an acting term, there's a loop. There's a loop between the audience and the performer, or there's a loop between the facilitator and the students. And film, you lose that because you're just performing for a camera. And so you're not able to get that feedback and you're not able to adapt because you don't know how the audience is going to respond to it until months later. Well, I mean, yeah, it is true. But and also at the same time, um, 
I feel like theater puts a certain pressure on you that film doesn't because maybe you have to do something like in the moment, whereas in film, you have a time to like reshoot a certain scene. And then, you know, there's always room for mistakes. I mean, there is room for mistakes in theater as well, but I think it just comes with a certain, you know, like being a little bit more free and creative in how you approach it rather than following a script or reshooting the same scene over and over again. So I see where you're coming from with that. And there's one show that I think about in particular where I was playing a detective and I went to a, a space where I had lost my part in the script. I wasn't sure where I was. I, I don't know what had happened. I tripped over my, my words, I guess. And all of a sudden they ended up in a part of the script and I was going, where am I? And one of the actors on stage went, oh, detective, you want to go this way? And <laughs> it was just a moment where she knew she could tell what had happened and was getting ready to support me. And afterwards, to me, that moment speaks to the value of what a theater ensemble does, is that we've worked together so closely and so well that she was able to diagnose, okay, Hartley's off track, and quickly figure out how do I get him back on track, and did it in a way that the audience had no idea. And to me, putting your, that kind of trust in an ensemble is something that is really hard to capture in film in the same way, because if you make that mistake, they just say, cut, let's go back and try it again. Awesome. That's super interesting. So how did you um, make that switch between wanting to be an English major to being uh, interested in theater? I auditioned for my first show. Is Wait, what, what was it, if you don't mind us asking? So the show that I auditioned for was, um, oh, the first show I auditioned for, I don't remember because I didn't get cast. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I, I tell the story often. Uh, my good friend Owen, uh, he was an actor. He performed in grade nine, grade 10, and it wasn't until grade, uh, grade 10 when I said, oh, maybe I'll do some theater. And he said, yeah, come along. And got up, got up on stage in front of the, the teachers who were evaluating us, and I, I stopped and I walked off and said I couldn't do it. And Owen chased me out, and I don't think he actually meant this threat, but he said, if you don't get back in there and audition, we're not going to be friends anymore. <laughs> and went back, auditioned, didn't get a role, but thought, okay, I could do this. And then in grade 11, when I auditioned, I got my first role, which was in The Merchant of Venice, a uh, Shakespeare play. And I was given a very small role called Stefano, the servant. He was a servant to Portia. And I had a couple of lines, but just being on stage and feeling that collective really made me feel at home. And then started to audition for more shows in high school and because of that, just having more, more and more positive experiences in the, the theater space, I started going, started thinking to myself, okay, could I pursue an undergrad in theater and pursue that even more? And that's, that kind of shifted my track. So being, being involved in my first production and getting a taste of what it was like to perform really shifted uh, the direction my life went in. That's crazy. People always tell me, Ali, be open to like trying new things. And, you know, hearing other people say that that's how they got into like understanding what the, the career that they're interested in is like it opens your eye. Like, wow, we should actually try different things. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. That was, uh, well, you said you, you've, t you've told that story before? I have, yes. Oh, okay, we're not breaking it. Not, not on this <laughs> no, podcast. No, well, just because it's such a, it's such a, because for that reason, I tell that story a lot because it's that the, the journey story of mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be an English major, auditioned for a show, then all of a sudden said, no, theater is where I want to go. And mm -hmm. in my first year, my program was very small. There were 20 students in the theater program. Mm -hmm. And in the very first day, we sat in a circle and we all had to share, say our name and say what we wanted to do with our theater degrees. And of the 20 of us, a, like a vast majority wanted to be actors, myself included. I said, hi, I'm Hartley from Toronto. I want to be an actor. <laughs> and that was the goal. And similarly to high school, started going through my theater degree. And in my fourth year, entering my fourth year of undergrad, I had mapped out the Master of Fine Arts programs for acting that I was going to be applying to. And I was getting my audition pieces ready because I, I was going to do this. I was going to increase my training and then finish my MFA and then audition. And my last year of undergrad, the fall, I got introduced to Augusto Boal and applied theater. And the minute I picked up the theater of the oppressed, I couldn't put it down. And I just started learning and researching what is applied theater? How does this work? What does this operate? And then 
I didn't apply to a single MFA acting program. I applied to MA applied theater programs because for me it was going, no, 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 this, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to explore. And then that took me on my journey to, to health side, going from my degree in applied theater to learning about theater and healthcare to BHAC. So having that, having that open mind, which I don't think I thought was open at the time, um, but having that open mind can really take you to new, new experiences and new places. Okay, I was gonna say theater actually had a really big impact on my life. I took a lot of theater classes when I was younger, actually. Um, this is not something I've ever talked about, but it's because when I was little, I used to be so shy that I did not talk to a single person and I didn't have a single friend in school. So my parents forced me into theater class and I was like, fuck you, like, you have to start learning to talk to people. And that's how I actually kind of like developed the personality that I have today. So yeah, theater is super super important I think. Do you remember any roles that you had like any memorable roles that you played yeah. when you were younger? In the eighth grade I was actually I, I speak French so I was in the lead in this French play and I was the daughter of this household and I remember I was just the girl who complained a lot about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Highlight of my uh, acting career. Yeah. But, I mean, I definitely didn't have anything uh, like crazy when it comes to like auditioning and um, acting or anything like that. But I remember when I was very little and I come from Iran, like a Middle Eastern country. And over there in elementary school, they tried to have a lot of those um, acts. And I don't know if they do it here in elementary school, but everyone's kind of involved. All the students in your class uh, do like a certain play and then all the students in the other class do a certain play like a very famous story that they tell in, in, in the country all the time to kids over there. So I, like they do implement it in there. Um, and then my question following that is, why do you think hardly that we kind of lose that sense of playfulness, that creativity that we have when we're kids? Like, why do we, and I watched your TED talk, but you kind of talked about it a little bit. You say, why do we stop playing? Like, what's the reason? Like, I remember always being excited to do that sort of stuff. But as we get older, like, what's the reason we lose interest in doing stuff like that? Part of it's cultural that it's culturally play is seen as something that is not productive or a waste of time, though that is, that, that is certainly changing in a lot of respects. Part of it as well is the education system. This is partly why I love teaching in BHSE because it has a different teaching philosophy than I think a lot of other places. That creativity isn't rewarded. And for me, and I think BHSC fosters this philosophy as well, is that you can try something, test something out, be creative, be spectacularly unsuccessful, and still do well in a course. And I think a lot of education is designed where if you take risks and you are not successful, you're not going to do well. And so that makes sense to me as to why that playfulness and that experimentation and that creativity goes away because it's not rewarded. And in high school, a lot of students look at a rubric and say, okay, I'm going to give the teacher the rubric and then I will be rewarded with a good grade. And that makes for very kind of good rubric following students. And for me, I, I, there'd be a lot of value if education rewarded that type of creative exploration and, and creativity, as long as people are able to say, I tried this, this was my intent, it didn't work out, this is what I learned from it. So there still has to be learning. It can't just be you try something and, and are unsuccessful and that's it. But as long as you're able to demonstrate the learning and demonstrate how it could have been done differently, that should be rewarded. And I think educationally, a lot of the time it's not. And so that is, that contributes to that lack of play and the, the play reduction. I was going to say in the eighth grade for me, I kind of went to this experimental kind of school and we had this thing where instead of a course, we were allowed to work on whatever project that we wanted, whether it be music, 
English, writing, math, anything. And I remember like that was the first year that I actually finished my writing my first book. And I didn't think that I would ever have the time to do that. And just being given that opportunity at a young age, I think fostered like my, my creativity when I was older. I think more schools should implement that kind of thing. And workplaces too. Workplaces are equally as, um, can be very unplayful spaces. And part of that is one of the pieces that I try to encourage, particularly when working in, in healthcare spaces, is that playful doesn't mean unprofessional. And that is often a common misconception that if someone's playful, they're childish and therefore that's not professional. When you can still be playful and professional and that kind of playful, playful professionalism can be really valuable for a, a workspace. Um, and yeah, Harley, we don't want to hold you for too much longer. Um, so we have this final segment where we're going to hit you with a rapid fire rapid question. Fire? Yes. Okay. And these are things that you can, you know, expound upon or any comments that you have on them to share it with us. Sure. Okay, the first one I have here was, um, if you weren't a facilitator at the moment, what would you be? Hmm. Okay. If I wasn't a facilitator right now, what would I be? Whew. That's a great question. And it's a tough one to answer. For me, it would, be, it would be a job where I'd still be interacting with people. I don't think I could do a job where I wasn't engaging with others. And for me, what I would love to do in kind of an ideal, a COVID-free world is that I would love to be able to travel to different countries and then be a tour guide in those countries. I wouldn't want to be a tour guide in the same country because for me, that would, could fall into, that's like being in the same play forever. You know, you don't want to be in the same play forever. You want to be in a play and then that play wraps, then you're in a new play, learn a new script. So for me, I love to travel and having the opportunity to travel, to meet new people and to explore and experience new places. If that job exists, that'd be the job for me. Wow. <laughs> a unique answer. <laughs> it would be a great tour guide. I, I see it. Like, that would be great. It's so fun. Okay. What is something that everyone should try to experience at least once in their lifetime? I'm biased, but I'd say perform on a stage. Perform in front of others is something that could be, as you talked about, Rebecca, how valuable that was for you, just to be, be put out there. And coupled with that, I, I would say is that something that everybody should try in their lifetime is doing something that you are not good at. There's a lot that can be gained from going through the experience of going, I cannot do this well, but I'm going to engage in it and seeing what that feels like. A lot of the time we're compelled and we're pulled towards things that we do well, and there's a comfort in that. Though there's a lot of value in engaging with a new skill or something that you're not comfortable with. So I would say, try something that you, you think you're not good at or that you think you might not be comfortable with. It might surprise you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and on that note, what are some of your favorite hobbies? Favorite hobbies. In recent years, I've gotten into cooking and experimenting in the kitchen. So mm -hmm. for me, that's been a new, um, really fun, creative experimentation of what could, what could be good? What flavors match together? Mm -hmm. Try stuff out. Um, mm -hmm. Other pieces, I mean, I've, I've got a close group of friends where we play a lot of board games and video games, uh, not video games, board games, and, um, and now in COVID kind of online games, uh, which, is, which is a lot of fun um, to connect with others and, and kind of, engage through again through play interesting what are you looking forward to the most in regards to becoming a father <laughs> mm. part of it is seeing the world fresh again mm -hmm. because one of the in my acting training there is uh, an acting theorist stanislavski who talks about as an actor you need to be able to find the wonder in your character and as your character experiences a play, they need to be living the world as if they're experiencing that play for the first time, right? They can't know the ending, even though as the performer, you know the ending, but as a character on a stage, you can't play to the end because you have to perform for the audience as if you're learning everything new again. And that's been really exciting about parenthood is that you're able to experience the world fresh and new. There's a lot of questions that get asked, why, why, why? And it gets you thinking, yeah, why, why is it that way? Why do we do that? Tonight, we were learning and talking about, is garlic a vegetable? 
And I learned tonight that, confirmed tonight that yes, indeed, garlic is a vegetable. So things like that, where I've been able to learn things that I probably would never have looked at previously and, and to reframe my thinking of why is it that way? And just to ask the why. I had another one here, which ties in very good with one of the hobbies that you described. Do pineapples <laughs> belong no. on pizza? Everywhere I go, you're like the pie. <laughs> I see, partly, is okay. a strong disagreement with pineapple on pizza, but why? Okay, Ali, here's the thing. There, are cert <laughs> there, are certain, there, is, there is a pizza that I love where it's um, pear on a pizza. That, delicious, amazing. <laughs> Pineapple, on the other hand, no what? business, no business being on a pizza. Um, I don't know what it is. I know, I know the pineapple on pizza is a very divisive conversation. There are certain fruits that you can put on a pizza, uh, but pineapple is not one of them. Wait, were you being serious about the pear? I have never seen that. Oh my goodness, yeah. You get some pear, you get some stinky cheese, you get some <laughs> walnut, you get some arugula, you get a little bit of honey drizzle on there. That's a good pizza. Oh no way. I have to try that. I've never had that. I have to strongly I disagree with this <laughs> sentiment because whenever I get pizza, I ask for extra pineapple on it. And I absolutely, <laughs> I cannot eat arugula. I, I smell it and I want to puke. So, <laughs> so Rebecca, so you and I will, will not be sharing a pizza. Yeah. Uh, Ali, would you, are you a, are you a co, uh, no pineapple on pizza or are you with Rebecca and staying? I, 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 I told Rebecca I've never had pizza with pineapple on it, but I'm sure I won't like hate it. I'm going to eat it either way. I'm a guy that will eat literally <laughs> anything. And then when you describe the pizza that you did with the pear, I was like, wow, I need to try that first thing. <laughs> when COVID is over, we have to go outside and I need to try that pizza. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, and then, Rebecca, do you have any more questions? I have one last question here that I go was ahead. dying to ask Hartley. And that is, oh, what's no. your favorite movie? Favorite movie and favorite TV show? And favorite Survivor. play. Favorite play. So uh, that's a lot of questions, but <laughs> okay, putting you on the spot there. Yeah. Okay. So favorite movies. I'll go for two. One is a childhood favorite, The Shawshank Redemption. I mm -hmm. it was a, it's a movie that I could watch over and over again. That I watched over and over again as a kid. That I absolutely loved, and that I know just inside and out. And the other one that was a childhood favorite that I still will put on to rewatch and, and find it very comforting is the, it's from the 1980s. It's a movie called Clue. It, the board game was made into a movie in the mid eighties. And it's just has a lot of hilarious comedic actors in their prime. Uh, so Clue and The Shy Shrek Redemption are from my two favorite movies. I haven't watched a lot of movies in, in recent years. Movies aren't where I go. TV shows is more what I watch now uh, for entertainment. Favorite TV shows? Uh, Survivor, Rebecca, absolutely. Survivor's got to be up there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Other other TV shows that I absolutely love are I'm a huge Lost fan. And mm. part of the reason why I suspect I'm drawn to Lost is because it's a show about characters and, can, and collective and ensemble, which very much mirrors a theater experience. Love Lost. Talking about recent shows, the show of 2020 for me was Ted Lasso. Absolutely loved it from beginning to end. I haven't seen that one. Oh, Highly recommend. Highly okay. recommend. Okay. Is it on Netflix? It's on Apple TV. Apple TV. Gonna check that one out. Okay. And then uh, play. Mm -hmm. Play is a tough one. So I'm thinking a couple of them that jump to mind is there is one of the plays that really that has a special place in my heart in terms of connecting me with my love of theater was in high school. Um, a play that I read that just who sucked me into the world was a play by a Canadian playwright, Morris Panitch. Uh, the play is called Seven Stories. It's a bit of a fantastical play that just is one of my first introductions to theater that, that I really love as a production. And another one that jumps to mind is a Canadian musical called Ride the Cyclone. And their, their recording album is supposed to drop any day now, which I'm super excited to, to buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, in terms of musicals, it's probably one of my favorites up there with, with Cabaret, which is a very dark, dark, dark subject matter, but, but a great musical through and through. Okay. I agree with Lost until the last season, though. I don't know what happened in the last season. It was a little bit, uh, they don't understand the ending, but a great I know that, I know the, the, the last season of Lost is, is the season that really divides Lost fans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you enjoy the ending? Well, no, no spoilers, but... No spoilers. Ultimately, I did. Okay. Could it have been better? Yes. 
Yeah. Ultimately, okay. though, enjoy the ending. Okay. Fair enough. I agree with that. Um, yeah. With that being said, that's all I have on the docket. Did you have anything else, Rebecca? No, I think it brings us to the end of our episode. Yes. Thank you again, Hartley, so much for being here. Thank you so much. And yeah, any closing remarks uh, before we go? Thank you so much, Ali and Rebecca, for having me. What I'll say before I go is something that both aligns with one of the, my favorite books and the philosophy of improv. It's a book that I read uh, probably in the 2010, nine era. Um, it's a book called Yes Man by Danny Wallace. It was made into a terrible movie with Jim Carrey. Yeah. But don't, so if you've seen the movie, don't let the movie kind of spoil the book. And yeah. in the book, uh, Danny Wallace is a guy who's down in his luck and he meets a stranger on the bus who tells him to say yes more. And as a result, he spends six months of his life saying yes to any question that gets asked. Hey, do you want to go out for dinner? Yes. Hey, we're looking for someone to take on this project. Do you want to do it? Yes. And just was opening himself up to any possibility by saying yes. And for me, I didn't really draw the connection until very recently in the past couple of years, but the idea around the, the rule of the golden rule of improv, which is the yes and rule, how the yes and rule of improv aligns so nicely with the yes man book and this idea around being open to new experiences. And so one of the pieces that I, I often offer up is, is grab the yes, say yes when you can because you never know what might happen when you say yes. It's so easy to say no. And I remember after finishing the book, um, to, to circle back to my good friend Owen, I remember I had gotten, uh, I had gone out for dinner with my family, had gone, had gone home, and I got a text from him saying, hey, we're going to do a late night dinner. Do you wanna join, hang out? I know you've already eaten, do you wanna go and join out? And my initial response was, it's nine o'clock. I just got home from <laughs> dinner with my family. I'm gonna say no. But I was just, Having just finished the book, I thought, yeah, I'll go. And got, you know, got ready, hopped on the subway, went down, had a, had a fun evening, and nothing kind of consequential came of it, but it was a really fun night. And in the book, what happens to Danny Wallace, not to, not to spoil anything, but by saying yes, he finds himself into, in new opportunities and, and in, in conversations and experience that he never thought he would have found himself in with. Had he said no? Um, so I guess my closing thoughts are, say yes more. Awesome. Yeah. There you have it. Thank you so much again, Harley. Thank you so much for joining us. And happy Monday, everyone. We'll catch you guys in the next episode. Yes. Bye. Bye.